Hey guys and welcome back to our lecture series. I'm Ted, your host, and for today's lecture we're going to discuss the election of 1824. Now, uh, before we begin our lecture proper, I'd like to do our customary recap and just re uh, just retouch slightly on what we discussed in our last lecture. So in our last lecture we discussed the rise of textile mills, we, we discussed the expansion really of mill operation of manufacturing and how the manufacturing competition uh, drove artisans uh, out of business and it also drove other small scale, small time manufacturers out of business. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, in, their, in their anger those those put out of business turned their frustration out on the legislature that sponsored that chartered these um, these mill operations and that the mill operations themselves gained the enmity of their workers as workers politicized they formed the early unions in the United States uh, they politicized they and they sought relief through the ballot to protect themselves from the threat of firings or the use of immigrant labor or in the case when the, the labor was immigrants uh, were compliance of our members of an immigrant community the use of free black labor in the north um, in the north and in the uh, in the uh, western states as well the western lands one of the uh, reasons for, for the prohibition against uh, black migration had been you didn't want them to undercut the the uh, the city dwellers the urban workers in the workforce um, and with that being said I'd like to jump straight into our lecture um, and before we begin our lecture, there, there, there are really only two elections in the early republic's history that, 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 um, that were really contentious, that are really watershed moments. One would be the election of 1800 in which Jefferson um, came out over Burr and the other would be the election of 1824 because they both uh, heralded the, the, the great shift, the great change in the nation's history. Um, and with that being said, let's dive right into to our, to our lecture topic today. With the close of James Monroe's second term in office in 1824, there came a flurry of political agitation on who his successor would be. Uh, with the death of Hamilton and the folly of the Hartford Convention, the Federalist Party had gradually ebbed away had the political force in the nation, leaving the Democratic Republicans at the only political party in the country. Um, hence the uh, the name, the era of good feelings. Uh, the death of party politics were supposed to herald the uh, the rise of uh, one party rule and good feelings uh, amongst all Americans. <coughs> now, uh, the presidential successor had been chosen through a caucus comprised of members of the House of Representatives, and typically the Secretary of State would be chosen to succeed to the presidency. Now this caucus system worked only if the party members followed party discipline and supported the most likely candidate. That is the person who had the most supporters in the House of Representatives. And but, uh, but by 1824, as we have seen, the nation was being pulled in too many directions and too many factions had arisen in the Democratic Rep Republican Party for it to function like it had. Uh, the two principal factions were the old guard, Democratic Republicans, and the new men, the national men, the national Republicans. Um, now, the traditional party presidential successor, uh, Secretary of State John Quincy Adams, uh, was, was a national man. His nomination could potentially destroy, but his nomination could potentially destroy the caucus system. Um, besides his national leanings, he had a lot of other faults, uh, namely his biggest fault was the fact that he was the son of former Federalist President John Adams. Uh, but he also had a lot of major accomplishments to really spur his, uh, his choice as a, as a presidential successor. Uh, John Quincy Adams had served as the United States Ambassador to the Russian Empire. He had, he had been a uh, principal negotiator for the Treaty of Gent. He had served as Monroe's Secretary of State. He negotiated the adams onis Treaty, which brought Florida into the Union, uh, into United States possession, actually. Uh, and he had authored the Monroe Doctrine, 
um, which sort of uh, echoed uh, the United States sort of newfound swagger uh, in the post-Napoleonic uh, apocalypse that, that Europe really was going through in the 1820s. Uh, even though the Monroe Doctrine uh, didn't oppress anything upon the European powers and they would continue to just ignore it, um, he had authored it. He had authored that document. Uh, and he faced stiff, uh, stiff competition for nomination uh, from Henry Clay. Henry Clay was the leader of the new men from the West, and he also happened to serve as the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Now, Clay too had his faults. He was, after all, the point man for the national men. Uh, he was outspoken and in support of the American system. Uh, the, that, that is, this new system we, we were seeing uh, put in operation in the United States. Um, he was in favor of protected tariffs to give domestic manufacturing a leg up on foreign goods. Uh, he was in favor of federal aid for new businesses. He was in, uh, he was, uh, in favor of federal aid for developing raw goods and federal aid for the creation of an internal transportation network. As a matter of fact, the internal transportation network was his brainchild. Clay's detractors claimed that he was deviating from party beliefs by pushing for unprecedented increase in federal power into the national economy. Now, this plan in particular alienated Southeastern Americans. Uh, who saw this program as benefiting northern industrialists and western and the western producers of raw goods. It, it was simply not economically viable for them. Now, the old guard Democratic Republicans, the, the old guard, were perturbed by both prospects. Uh, they saw both candidates as advocates of government spending, which meant government taxes, which meant taxing agriculture in their minds. Uh, slave owners, they were alarmed by the idea that a federal government powerful enough to intervene in the nation's economy might one day decide to intervene in the nation's most conspicuous form of labor, chattel slavery. Um, the old guard had their candidate, William H. Crawford of Georgia. Now Crawford was a party man. He had served as Secretary of War for James Madison. Uh, he had served as Secretary of the Treasury for James Monroe. He, however, was not very popular, and more importantly, he has suffered a debilitating stroke recently, and he, but he, but he was still preferred had a better candidate than Clay or Adams. Um, and so it was on June 24th of February uh, 1824 that the party caucus met. Uh, now Clay and Clay supporters refused to attend the meet uh, the, the 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 caucus, and Clay was uh, not Clay Crawford was nominated by those in attendance. Now the abstention of Clay supporters killed the party system. It was dead. Uh, the Democratic Republican Party at this moment had ceased to exist, and Clay and his supporters went on to simply become the National Republicans. Um, the party system is dead. Clay and his supporters, their abstention effectively killed it. They were, they were not going to be uh, nice, playing, uh, nice playing or nice getting together uh, between the men uh, and their supporters. Uh, Clay went out and worked over the state legislatures of Kentucky and Missouri to nominate him, and they did. Adams, uh, seeing the writing on the wall, followed suit and had the legislatures of New York and New England support him, nominate him as a candidate for president. And again, these men are tapping into that democratic thrust. Uh, the House, uh, the House still um, functioned at the caucus, but the House was receiving orders from the state legislature where the people had direct say. Uh, but but as we can see with, with uh, what Clay and Adams had done, they simply bypassed the, uh, the House altogether. They, they knew they wouldn't win in the House, so they went to their own individual basis and they drummed up support in their own indiv individual basis to get nominations in their basis. Now, now uh, all of a sudden, uh, in 1824, um, there were three presidential nominees from what many people were still trying to hopefully term one party. Uh, you had three 
members of the Democrat or former members of the Democratic Republican Party uh, who were running for president all in opposition to each other. A situation that that uh, could potentially result in no candidate receiving a necessary majority in the Electoral College. And in, in which case the election will be sent to the House of Representatives where Clay would have the advantage. And for the discontented masses with grievances over the National Bank, the panic of 1819, the rise of manufacturing, uh, the debt crisis, and the collapse of worker protection from industrialists, they, there was another candidate. They, they had finally found their man, and their man was Andrew Jackson. Now, Jackson was the hero of the Battle of New Orleans. He was tall, gaunt, uh, he possessed a very violent temper. Uh, that's the number one thing you should remember about, uh, remember about Andrew Jackson. He possessed a very violent temper. Uh, he was born to Scots-Irish immigrants in the South Carolina backwoods. He had been orphaned at a young age, losing both of his parents while still a minor, and two of his brothers died. Uh, his, his two older brothers died during the Revolution. Um, at 14, he left what family he had... Uh, left to him and he set off on his own for the wilderness of Tennessee. Um, in the wilderness he read law, he became a public prosecutor, he bought his first slave, fought his first duel, and served as Tennessee's first representative to Congress. He really thrived in the West, uh, came into his own. Uh, he soon left politics though because it bored him. Um, uh, and he uh, he gained a position as a he gained a position um, as a as a commander in the Tennessee State Militia and earned a reputation as an Indian fighter. Now Jackson uh, had an almost limitless capacity for hatred. He nursed uh, intense grievances against invisible enemies all his life. Now the military man he now had a real enemy that he could take all his frustrations on. Um, but not content with that, Jackson also participated in dueling, particularly duels concerning his wife. And when we, when we discuss Andrew Jackson in, uh, in a later lecture, we will go over the, the, the reasoning for his duels concerning his wife and, uh, and how that was a, 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 a touchy subject for him. Now, with the election uh, of 1812, when the, when the results came in, they were pretty dismal to, for all candidates. Uh, Jackson had swept the nation. Uh, including uh, the popular vote, but not the Electoral College. Uh, Jackson swept the nation. He had the most votes of any candidate, but he did not win a majority in the Electoral College. He did not win enough states. Um, he only garnered 99 votes in the Electoral College. Uh, Quincy Adams, John Quincy Adams, came in second. John Quincy Adams got, he, he garnered 84 electoral votes. Um, that's, that's a difference of only 15 electoral votes between Jackson and, and Quincy Adams. Uh, to sort of underscore Quincy Adams' support and his appeal, particularly in New York and particularly in New England. Uh, coming in third was, uh, um, not, not Clay, uh, coming in third with Crawford, who received 41 electoral votes. And Clay, Clay, who was supposed to win the election outright, um, and, and if not outright, win it in the, in, the, uh, in the House, came in fourth with 34 votes. Now, the election was not over. Jackson needed a majority. Jackson or Adams needed a majority to win. Um, and with no, clear, with, with no clear winner in the Electoral College, the, the vote would be sent to the House Representatives. Now, this was the first election to expose the great rifts of sectional differences in the United States. Has various regions championed specific men for the presidency, and it was really uncertain if the nation could survive the election, uh, if the losers would accept their defeat. If Jackson lost, no one really knew what Jackson would do. Jackson was still um, a many... And many people's opinion, including former President Thomas Jefferson, he was just an unsuitable man. He was simply just a wild card. Um, uh, no one really knew if uh, Clay 
or Adams would really accept a Jackson presidency. No one really knew if if the nation, if the, if the uh, national political leaders, if, if people who did not like what would happen, if they would go on and accept the, uh, the election results. And we won't get into the election results in this lecture. We'll break here and we'll come back and discuss everything in our next lecture. Um, as always, I want to thank you guys for taking the time to listen to the lecture, to watch and listen. Uh, hit like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what you guys thought about the election, about the, uh, the very peculiar nature of the election of 1824. And as always, uh, I'm Ted. Hit like, subscribe, and comment. I'll see you guys for, next, for another lecture uh, next time.